so just everybody be aware. Go. And Don, it is your show. There you go. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Jeff. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is the 2023 USATF Nat, um, Niagara High Performance Clinic Series. And tonight, we're very, very honored to have uh, two of my very close friends, uh, Jeff Selvage, who is a professor at Drexel University, also the creator, owner, and the mastermind behind racewalk.com. And uh, you'll hear that more and more tonight. Um, he and I serve uh, on the board for USA Racewalk Foundation. Jeff is also a world athletics judge, which is certified to judge internationally. And one of uh, one of the best judges I've, I've seen because he really studies it uh, day in and day out and, and always a welcome sight to see him at races because you know it's gonna be done right. Uh, Sharon Guardadero, who is a USATF Niagara uh, master's athlete. I'll say that first, Sharon. How's that make you feel? Uh, and she's also a national level USATF race walk official, a high school section five in uh, New York State official, and uh, also also AJ's mom. Awesome. AJ is one of the uh, uh, fantastic uh, distance walkers in the country. Just finishing sixth place in the thirty-five kilometer, and. Uh, Mom, AJ, is out there uh, providing him good nutrition throughout the event, as well as feeding video to hundreds of onlookers that weren't able to make the uh, trip to San Diego. So anyway, uh, without further ado, Jeff Salvage, who has a wonderful presentation. I want everyone to just sit back, take some notes, and this is recorded, um, but uh, think up some really cool questions, because here we are. And my name is Don Lawrence, by the way, Association. Uh, USATF official and uh, natural, uh, natural. I am the high performance chair and race walk chair for USATF Niagara. Jeff, thank you very much. We, we're honored to have you in our presence. Great, thanks. Before we start, I actually want to thank Gary Westerfield because um, the slide deck that you're about to see was put together with Gary, uh, Dave Harriman, and a couple other people. So I, I'm being the showman, but there's a lot of people who worked on it behind the scenes. We're going to kind of start with a very brief introduction to basically what is race walking, um, because there are officials here that are not as familiar with the race walking, some that are, so we're going to assume nothing. And the first thing we're going to do is just give you a very high level overview of how to differentiate race walking from running. It's been an Olympic event since 1904. I actually found this picture, I think I got it off of eBay from a, a uh, estate sale of some famous person who happened to collect race walking pictures. But circa 1930s, race walking was very different. It was a race, the, the Coney Island Walk was one of the big races in New York, and it would go from City Hall to Coney Island and they'd close the streets and all kinds of stuff. Um, but race walking has evolved over, the, over time. And it has evolved in the way it looks, it has evolved officially in the rules. So you hear a lot of people say, well, they're not walking because they're not doing this or that. And it sort of depends on when you learn to race walk, what you think race walking is. But race walking is defined by a definition from USATF and World Athletics. And that's what we go by. So what is race walking, right? It's different than running. That should be obvious. But it's not running and it's not normal walking. Normal walking to me is what I would call pedestrianism. You hear another term thrown out called power walking. That's something else and sorts of all sorts of different things. So we're going to look at just a series of videos, and this should look very normal. This is, assuming it wants to start, a group of runners. Um, a lot of the video we're showing you is in slow motion, so it's easier to see. And you see that both feet are off the ground for an instant, and the knee lands in a flexed position. The leg is not straightened at the moment of contact. That is your typical running that we are used to seeing. Now let's look at a group of pedestrians. Okay, pedestrians walk the way normal people casually walk. They land with a flexed knee when they strike the ground, and they typically have contact with the ground at all times. So for a moment or more than a moment, both feet are in contact with the ground. All right, now we're going to look at a group of slow race walkers. And as you start to learn to judge, learning with slower walkers is going to be easier to discern than jumping right into an elite competition like uh, Sharon was at a week and a half ago. So here are slow walkers. We see that they're landing with their leg extended. 
so that it's straightened on impact and that they have a moment where both feet are in contact with the, with the ground, in the, excuse me, in the ground, on the ground. Okay, when the walkers get a little faster, it becomes a little more difficult to see. Okay, and that's at full speed. Now, there are a few things that make this very, very difficult to judge over video, over the internet. Now we're gonna see it slow, slowing down. And you will see that both feet are off the ground for a moment. We'll talk about that. That is not illegal in race walking. It was illegal when Don and I learned to walk. In our day, we had to keep a foot on the ground at all times. They changed the rule and we'll go into the difference. What you're looking at is impossible to judge. When I'm projecting over Zoom, you're getting about 15 frames per second from the video camera. The human eye can easily pick up 120. Um, 240 is probably the gold standard, and there's no video at 240 that can play back at full speed. So video is always going to be a, a bit of a handicap, but it's still a good educational tool to learn these things. So let's now just compare a single runner and a single race walker. And that gives us a nice distinction. You see the race walker fully extending its leg, and you see that one foot is on the ground or very close to being on the ground at all times. The runner is has an obvious flight phase and an obvious flex knee when they strike the ground. Okay, now you wanna pick out the pedestrian from the race walkers. This is your first judging attempt here. Okay, and we haven't even talked about the rules or anything, right? But it should be pretty obvious that one person is different than everybody else. That one person is actually an Olympic race walker, Alan James, um, but he was, uh, showing us what it looks like to be a pedestrian. So he's the guy in the uh, in the red hat, and he is the obvious pedestrian. Uh, by the way, I can't see anybody because I'm in optimized for video mode. But if anyone has questions at any time, I'm I'm used to students shouting out uh, inquiries all the time. So please feel free to interrupt and ask a question. Don't don't hold it to the end. Hey, Jeff, I think Don and I are both also Kurt, sort of keeping an eye on the group so if we okay. see someone has something great yeah pull just, that out, so. some people want to be polite and don't want to interrupt by all means just interrupt uh, you, you're not going to derail <laughs> my personality um single runner and many race walkers right so now you want to pick out the person who's running now these are obvious cases obviously judging is going to be more difficult than this Okay, and again, it should be obvious that our friend Alan James is demonstrating running. All right, he's got both feet in the air for an extended visible period of time, and he's landing with a flex knee. Okay, let's just look at a single race walker. Okay, you see the pronounced straightened knee stays straightened through vertical and beyond. Um, we do see a flight phase, but we see that flight phase because the walker is in slow motion. This is probably at half speed. If they were at full speed, you would not see that to the human eye. Okay, now we're going to look at a group of all race walkers. So we see her again, and there's a couple of people following her. Come on. Is there an is there an elevation for for the shoulders to balance with the hips and the and the legs? So the body moves like you know in, in a combination of motions all at the same time. So when the hip rotates forward, the shoulders are going to rotate as well. When the hip mm -hmm. rotates, you're also going to see the hip drop. So if you look at Maria, who's a, a two time Olympian right here. Um, mm -hmm. Can you guys see my mouse if I'm moving it? Correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. That's what yes. I thought. You you can see that her hip is starting to drop. And when that hip drops, then the, the opposite shoulder kind of drops, right? So you're, you're going to get motion in the upper body. As a judge, we don't look at the upper body other than if they're in a distance and you see them coming and they're like all over the place, you say, hmm, maybe when that person gets a little closer to me, I'll look at them more carefully because... The truth of the matter is, if 20 race walkers come at you in a pack, you can't focus on all 20, right? You've got to 
kind of do a triage, like a mash unit and decide who looks the worst. Let me look at them first and I'll see <laughs> if there's anybody else. It's, you know, it's an art, not just a, not, not a true science. Mm -hmm. okay. I think the other thing, Jeff, with, with high school race walkers, several of you on here also do high school is um, I think what I find is a lot of our high schoolers do have a lot of upper body movement. They haven't learned that core strength that it, it really takes to, to hold your carriage as you're, as you're race walking. And so they look a little funky up top um, because they're missing that, that core strength. And that's okay, right? There's, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with somebody um, from a legality perspective, not an efficiency right. perspective, having all that extra motion. So, so this is the definition of race walking, right? Race walking is a progression of steps. So taken that the walker makes contact with the ground so that no visible to the human eye loss of contact occurs. So the first half is basically saying you look at them and they look like they're in contact with the ground. You don't need to, to think of that any more complicated than it is. We look at it in, in great detail to kind of quantify what does it mean to actually be off the ground um, and be visible. Studies say 40 milliseconds loss of contact is where very good judges begin to pick up loss of contact. 45 milliseconds, more judges will pick it up. By 50, most judges should be able to pick it up. But if you're the judge, you're not thinking about numbers. You see someone go by, you say, do I see loss of contact or not? If you, if you don't see loss of contact, you don't make a call for loss of contact. The other part of the, the definition is much harder for beginners and masters athletes than the elite athletes. Elite athletes rarely get a bent knee call. Masters athletes and beginners will get it quite a lot. The advancing leg must be straightened, i.e. not bent at the knee, from the moment of first contact with the ground until in the vertical position. And we'll dissect this in a series of, of, of images and videos so that you understand the nuance. But that's it. The definition doesn't say what's going on with the head, the arms, the shoulders, the torso, right? So all of that you can use to decide to look at someone more closely. But when you're deciding to give, and we'll go into detail in a little bit, a yellow paddle or a red card, it's solely based on these two bullets that make up a single definition of race walking. Okay. Yeah, because back, back in the 1968 Olympics, um, when I was young and, and it's a saint, um, <laughs> I saw uh, Lieutenant Pedraza in, in the 68 in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. and, and his arms was always at, at the level of his hips. I mean, never. So, so you're saying he kept his arms low, which is what you want. To yeah. Do. It's more mm -hmm. efficient. Okay. And that's why he was at the Olympics. But if, if you're, if you're not efficient, right, then you're going to do other things. Right. And, and, you know, we, we coach youth athletes to do all sorts of things. The ones that listen end up doing better than the ones that don't. And well, you, know, you can demonstrate, we can demonstrate it right here. This is just, a group of Olympic hopefuls and, and some are now Olympians. Um, the three Olympians in there, see if you can name who. Um, and they're walking, you know, relatively low arm carriage, very smooth, right? They're, Miranda's talking there, so she's clearly not working very hard, right? But this was just a setup shot just to have a nice, nice clip of elite race walkers going smoothly. Can we mention that at this point that Miranda grew up in Rochester area in Section 5? Uh, Sharon, uh, what was the school? Uh, is that uh, um, Rush? Uh, it Rush. is Rush, Rush Henrietta, Rush. and we have Mike DeMay on the call tonight, um, who was her coach. So, Oh, there Mike, you, you did a good job because she is one fine person. Excellent. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. <laughs> um very good all right so let's go into the nuances of this when um when don and i learned to walk this is what was perceived of as ideal perfect technique right that you had a momentary double support phase at an elite level this does not happen i had to search through i don't know 
100,000 photos at the time to find anybody with double support. Um, Kurt on the left was crashing at the end of a 40K. John, I love him, wasn't really elite, but I wanted someone to balance out the picture. And and Dennis Nagora Gorodoff, or however you say his last name, had crashed at the end of the 50K at the Olympics in Athens in 2004 and was crawling to the finish line. But at their normal full blast speed, they have air. They're off the ground by a little bit. So it's unrealistic to expect elite walkers to maintain contact with the to maintain contact with the ground. And the reality is the rule doesn't say you must maintain contact. You must have no visible loss of contact. And the studies have said that that gives you about 40 milliseconds to up to 50 milliseconds, depending how you carry your feet, um, where you can be off the ground and it's still legal. So here's our star from, from uh, Rush, New York, Miranda Melville. Um, and she has no loss of contact. It is legal, but if that's the way she walks in competition, she's giving up that flight time that could make her a little bit more efficient. This is what we're looking at, right? She's off the ground here by just a little bit. And the human eye can't pick that up. So it's legal by the definition and it's more efficient in terms of racing. And uh, if you look at where her arms are, right, they're, they're relatively low. They're at the sternum and below. Okay, you can look, if you look at just that little speck of yellow, that's me drawing the difference between the amount of air and the ground. Okay. So very, very minor, you're not going to see that. Okay, it's only one frame of the camera. Now, she's off by a little bit more. You still can't see this to the human eye. Okay, this is still what we call a legal flight phase. All right, and I've got a video. Um, I'm going to put something in chat and do a self-promotion for a minute. If you go on YouTube um, and you go youtube.com slash at racewalk, um, that's the channel where I've put over 200 videos. And if you go to racewalk.com, I now have an officiating page and I'll put that in chat. And there'll be a lot of supportive videos um, in both of those places. Okay, so she's still a little bit off the ground, but we've said this is legal. This is legal race walking. You can't see it to the human eye. I have a video that dissects and does a, a deep dive into analyzing what loss of contact is and how you should measure it and that kind of thing. But when I asked her to be like, you know, off the ground, she was off the ground for basically 41 milliseconds, which is right where you want to be in that non-detectable range. Notice when I asked her to go faster, her arms came up a little bit, right? So that's normal. As you, you strain and push, your hands come higher. But I also was trying to get her off the ground as much as possible. The camera that I was using shot 240 frames a second. It was just my cell phone. But that gives you nine frames where she's off the ground. Oh, I'm sorry. This this one was only a point. This was 37.5 milliseconds off the ground. So she's below that threshold. Um, so not visible to the human eye. Okay, this guy, um, this was at the World Championships in London, was significantly off the ground. And you look at both feet being off the ground. And he made a move to get into the front and and pass everybody and he was disqualified so obviously there comes a point it's subjective when somebody is visibly off the ground we've said beginner walkers do not lift right um greater than 50 milliseconds is probably illegal between 40 and 50 is questionable okay a beginner race walker this is miranda simulating a beginning race walker will have both feet on the ground for an extended period of time. So you see the front foot has struck the ground, but the back foot isn't up on the rear toe yet, right? It's not illegal. It's just not efficient. Um, and if you watched Miranda walk this way, you would say, oh, I see visible contact. Now it's it's a little bit of a word salad, but we're not, we're, we're not trying to play the game. 
we're looking for loss of contact. We're not looking for visible contact. There's a, there's a lot of difference between those two. So let's look at these and, and you, you know, watching it over Zoom, it's only going to look so good. Uh, if you go to the YouTube channel, you'll see all the stuff a little bit better. Okay, so the visible contact, you can see that she is in contact with the ground. Momentary contact, very hard to tell, plus she's moving faster. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we look at it in slow motion, then of course you can see it. And we like to go to slow-mo so you know what you're looking at. But you know, you can see now where she gets that air, but you're not seeing that when it's at full speed. Miranda is a very legal race walker. She um I don't think she ever, but very rarely would get a loss of contact call. Okay, so now the middle walker is going to be the one with a significant flight phase and then an excessive flight phase. And even Miranda at her worst isn't that bad. Um, and it's still very hard to, to see over the internet. Um, but as a judge, you look, if you don't see a loss of contact, you don't make the call. All right, so now when you slow it down, you can really see the difference between the three strides. Yeah, Jeff, it's important to note at this point that her turnover rate is so much quicker than uh, so many of the other competitors. So she actually stands out as being very legal. Yeah, the, fa the faster your turnover rate, which is a good point, the more you can be off the ground because you won't see it. Right? Michelle Sorry. Roll was a perfect example of that, right? The yeah. turnover was very quick. Very quick. Okay. Now we're looking at people with what I would say is excessive loss of contact. Um, we, we may have a service interrupt this. My dog is waking up. This could be a problem. Um, but th this is really interesting. So if we look at these two walkers, um, I was judging the race. I had a camera running in the background. The walker in the front was walking at an amazing pace, looked fantastic and i was like wow i can't wait till i see the video they're only going to be off the ground like 30 milliseconds walker 22 looked awful got four or five red cards was bounced out of the race um walker 22 and 16 had relatively close amounts of loss of contact something else was going on so if we look at our you know frame by frame analysis, walker by walker, um, they look pretty similar, right? There's not that much different going on here. They're both, if you look at the middle image off the ground, subjective, whether it's excessive or not, because it's a still image. And you'd say these two would be judged pretty comparably. Then we get to the next one and there's a difference between the two walkers. And the difference is in how that rear foot is swinging forward. Number 16 keeps the rear foot a little bit lower and closer to the ground than 22. And if we watch this right here, right, they're in the basically the same part of the stride. Look where 22's foot is. Look where 16's foot is. It's all about how it looks. So we have a pretty good difference in the degree of, of raising that foot. And then we have almost double the height off the ground, right? So that's significant. And so that's why 22 was picking up the red cards and 16 was not. Okay, now we can watch it as a video. And hopefully you can see that there's a difference between the two. So. Is it fair that 22 got all the red cards and 16 did not? In my book, the answer is yes, it's fair because the rule is that you judge by the human eye and the human eye, Walker 22 looked awful and Walker 16 looks as smooth as can be. And that's what your job is. Your job is to judge 
by the human eye. Okay, so to some degree, it's a beauty contest, right? We're not judging the beauty of the arms and the head and the shoulders and all that other stuff. We're judging the legs. Do we see a straightened leg on contact? Does it stay straightened through vertical? And, and we'll dissect that a little bit more in a second. And do we see visible loss of contact? If we do not, we do nothing. We don't make a call. Okay, so now we can look at the straightened leg portion. And I use these two because they were older master's walkers. And master's walkers say, some say, well, I can't straighten my knee. And the answer to that is then you should be a power walker, right? If you're going to race walk, you must land with your knee fully extended, keep it straightened through vertical, and most walkers will keep it straightened after vertical. Okay, so here we see Miranda in a frame-by-frame -frame image of her with her leg straightening on contact, and it straightens right on contact. So you can't judge early. You have to wait until that heel strikes the ground, and then it stays straightened through vertical, and then strong walkers like Miranda will keep the leg straightened past vertical, and then when they come up on their rear foot and they're bending basically under the ball of the foot, that's when the knee bends. Okay, so now we can look at it a little close up. You have heel strike, the foot is um, raised, so the toe is higher. And we'll see later, we'll see someone who lands flat foot. And Sharon, I don't know, did you notice the, uh, the younger walker? Um, the boy who was landing and he looked like he was bent knee and he had really long shorts on that didn't help. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the video, he was landing almost perfectly flat foot, but he was strong yep. enough that his leg was actually straightened. And that's one of the things actually, Jeff, that I tell folks all the time, right? Because the, the question I always have from high school officials is, it's so hard, I don't know. And it, just a tiny tidbit that actually um, I got from um, Ian and Susan when I first started was to remind officials that when you look at that and, and that look for that straight leg, go from the heel up. Don't necessarily just look for the knee, like go for the, from the heel up because once that heel hits the point of contact, that's when your leg is gonna to start to be straight. It should be straight at that point once it hits. And it's easier, I think, to look, oh, they've hit the ground and then follow it all the way up than it is to try to hit it and figure out if the foot has touched the ground and is now when the knee is supposed to be straight. Very good. Yeah, that, that's a great <laughs> explanation of it. Um, let's move forward. Right. So we're going to move the leg stay straightened. The foot flattens over time. It doesn't slap. If it happens to slap, it's legal as long as the leg stays straight. Then we're in the vertical position and you can see her shoulder kind of coming down and the hip has come up. This is on the right side of her body. Right. These are all natural motions. And if somebody has an exaggerated motion, it should not affect the way that you judge. Then the leg is past vertical. Now it can bend at this point. Elite solid walkers will keep it straightened. Walkers that bend right at vertical sometimes don't look as good. And then you get back to that beauty contest. And the way I judge is if I'm not sure, I don't, I don't make a call. You're supposed to give the benefit of the doubt to the walker. If it's so close that you can't tell, there are other judges out there. If, 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 three judges or four with a, a penalty zone don't make the call, then you alone aren't causing a problem. And I always feel like it's better to not make a call than make a bad call and really upset the walker when it was unjustified. Um, and you'll learn over time. And, you know, you can have anyone set up a cell phone on a tripod and record the race and then look at it after the race to see if you made the right calls. Okay. And obviously the knee is bent when we push off. So now you see all six images again, and you see the legs staying straight through most of the stride beyond what is required for legality and then bending at push off. Mm -hmm. Now we could look at some walkers that are not legal. So this gentleman took a clinic. 
right? He this is the easy one. He he well easier. He lands bent. Eventually, he straightens past vertical. But if you land significantly bent and you're bent at vertical, you are not a legal race walker. And we can watch him. And that should be obvious that that person is not race walking, right? There's an obvious flex in the knee and it flexes through vertical. And if you're a beginning judge and you're at a local meet, you're not seeing elite walkers go through. So, and see that almost looks straight, but he's got to strike the ground. And he hasn't struck the ground yet. All right. This person lands straight, but he lands pretty far in front of his body. And when you land that far in front of your, in front of your body, it's very hard to maintain a straightened leg up to and including vertical. And he does not. So we can watch him. And he doesn't look like he's race walking. Okay, so the kind of walkers you'll see at the beginning will be very pronounced if they're not legal. And those are the ones you call. And the ones that are really close, you use your judgment. And if your judgment is wrong, you're one of many judges. So you're not disqualifying somebody. Um, and when we stay, the, the rule is written poorly. When we say straightened, it's not always, quote, a straight line. So Robert Korzanowski is the guy on the left, 108.5, four-time Olympic gold medalist. He hyperextends, and he's got a very bowed leg. That's not a straight leg, right? What they mean is, has it fully extended? The walker on the right has a knobby knee. But if you go ankle to knee to hip to straight line that's what you're looking for and the guy on the right hasn't even struck the ground yet right so we can't even judge him yet okay now we'll just look at a close-up of what a good straight knee looks like in slow motion and you can see miranda demonstrating beautiful technique okay landed with leg straight Stay straight to vertical, pass vertical, and then comes forward. Now you can see side by side, Miranda looking great. And I don't know who the schmo is on the right, um, <laughs> but that might be me. Um, so I land with bent knees and I stay bent. Through the stride. Okay. So look at Miranda again. And the nice thing, this, this will all be recorded. You can look at these videos to reinforce what you're doing. If you're about to go to, uh, to officiate a race, we've got a few tests online that you could take. Okay, so this is it just side by side. You may hear the term creeping. Creeping is basically slang for bent knee walking, right? I am not straightening before vertical okay and this just points out if you look at robin um her knee is bent here that's not illegal her foot hasn't struck the ground yet you have to wait until the foot makes contact with the ground walker number two um katie burnett there right has just struck the ground and her leg has just straightened that's what we're looking for okay if you have a different style, it doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. So this walker was the first person we recorded landing like flat foot, right? And wow, did that look awful in real life. If you get a situation like that in your first race, that's going to be hard to discern because at full speed, it looks weird. Um, but that's what we're going to ultimately, we're not looking whether the foot lands flat or not. We're solely looking did the leg land straighten? That looks beautiful, right? That's straightened, straightened past vertical. Everything that we want. Okay, and I think this is just a close-up of that just to highlight how different her feet are from Miranda's. And I frankly don't know how you can walk that way without killing yourself. Okay, how about this person? All right, and I'm going to stop and ask uh, everybody to, to give an opinion on this. Does this look like good legal race walking technique? 
So I'm going to stop my share so I can see everybody. Who wants to talk? How about you, Bill Martin? You're <laughs> muted. Still, still nothing. Bill Morgan. Now you're good. Oh no, was that you, Don? Yeah, that was me. Somebody who's going to be brave. Come on. We talk about these millennial kids that won't like make eye contact. How about Keith. Oop, Keith is down there. All right, go Keith. with Keith. You have to unmute, Keith. Let's say yes. Okay, so yes. All right, now, we were looking at just the bottom. I'm going to reshare. And now let's look at her whole body. And I want you to look at her head. Okay, just look at the head. Obviously, I've, I've blacked it out because she's a minor. All right, you see her head bouncing, and look at her hair bouncing. And her arms coming up and down. Right, that doesn't look good, does it? No, it doesn't look good. And that's a sign of, of um, a couple other things. But her legs look great. Absolutely. So she is a legal race walker, <laughs> right? She needs better coaching. I, I hope her coach isn't here. I'll be in trouble. She's probably a New York race walker. But right. The, from the waist down, she looks fantastic. From the waist up, you'd go, whoa, you know, that's someone I might look at, you know. Um, she's wasting look. some vertical energy on that yep. push off, and she's not moving forward and bouncing up, and that's the issue, but. Yeah, I think, okay. I think, you know, I've heard from a lot of either new officials or, you know, some who are sort of old school oh, their ponytail is bopping all over the place. That's a sign that they're running, that, they're, that, that they've got that flight time they're running um, because I can see them doing, I can see their ponytail swinging, coming at them. Um, so I think that's always, as Jeff said, a, a place to say, maybe I want to look at them, but I want to look at them when they're in my purview, not coming or going, but in my purview to see, is that leg straight when it hits the bottom? Is there really flight time? When uh, when I was judging in San Diego and, you know, I, I sort of asked to do the 35K every year because who doesn't want to go to sunny San Diego in January, right? And it was raining and miserable. And I, I was very, it was very hard to focus not just on the athletes, but then you got to write up a call and you don't want to get everything wet. Right. It, it was, it was a strain. So Katie Miali um, was racing and uh, other people took photos and gave them to me. And I put a photo story together and I wrote Katie and I said, Katie, you're out there for all the right reasons. You were smiling in every picture and the word downpour, right? She's smiling. The thing that I was happy about myself was, I never noticed in the race that she was smiling. I never, I never looked at her face. They came by. I was focused on their legs. That was the only thing I was looking at. Um, you know, one in a 35k, they spread out that you don't have to choose who to look at. You look at everybody as they go by and and make your call. Um, so, all right. So, I'm going to pause for a second. Um, we're sort of done with the evaluating a race walker, right? Are they legal or are they not? We we have to get into the nuances of how you make the call and the paperwork and all that. But before we move forward, uh, are there any questions just about um, how you would judge or make the, the decision in your mind whether someone is legal or Ill illegal? And, and I'm going to give a shout out to Mike DeMay. He, uh, he guessed that uh, the person was legal um, and that was correct. Don or Sharon, you want to add anything to, to what we've already talked about? This is your chance, guys. Um, you know, what I've noticed is that it, it's tough in indoors with 1,500 meters. It's a very quick race, seven and a half laps on a 200 meter. Um, and trying to get a judge to understand the difference, and maybe we'll touch upon this, 
what a caution is versus a uh, proposal for DQ or yeah, a we'll, warning. We'll get, we'll get to that in a second. So, you know, that's that's the hem haw thing. But I guess overall, as Jeff pointed out, if the walker appears being in contact with the ground, that flight phase wasn't obvious, then you're going to side with the athlete. I mean, it, you're not trying to pick them apart per se. We, you know, the knee is a little bit easier than the, the uh, loss of contact, obviously. And at the beginner level, you know, they're at 8.30 to 9.30, 10 minutes for 1,500. It's a little bit easier to see the knee, um, you know, when they're getting more in the state uh, championship level at seven minutes for 1,500. Uh, it gets a little bit more difficult, and especially on a bank track such as Ocean Breeze. So a lot of different things to uh, juggle. And, uh, you know, the only thing you can do is really dive in and, and do a practice session or apprentice uh, chat with someone that's experienced so that you can compare notes but take your own notes because it is an individual activity, uh, judging, not a team. Well, what do you think? Now, just do what you think and then see how the chips fall. And, and I will show you guys, we have two online tests that you can take um, if you're interested. Sharon, did you want to add anything? Uh, I think um, I think Don's right. I think, you know, the, many of us do high school um, between section five, section six, and 1500 meters is fast and furious for them. Um, you know, when I, when I look at the videos we've just looked at, I know that in section five, I know we have a young lady who has sort of a knobby, weird knee. Um, and for a long time, that threw officials with her because um, they couldn't figure out if she was straight or not. We have another girl right now who lands pretty flat footed, um, but she's straight going through. So I think, um, you know, I, I think Don makes a good point. When in doubt, you err on the side of caution and you side with in the athlete's favor. Great. All right, I'm gonna uh, switch screen sharing to non-video optimized because I don't think there's much video left. Um, so you can kind of read the, the fine print. And I just realized I've come up with nicer drawings than this and didn't put it into the <laughs> into the uh, into the PowerPoint. We we keep constantly improve these things. Um, at the level that you guys are starting at, you're not going to probably have to worry a whole lot about this. But um, typically, you have a zone on a track. You work within that zone. If it's a longer race, you may rotate the zones every 30 minutes. So if you're on a, a, a 1K or 2K loop um, and you're outdoors and you're at a three and a half, four, five hour race like we were on a week and a half ago, um, then every 30 minutes you rotate from one zone to the next zone so that you can see everybody um, in different cases. So I was actually on the turn and I saw some people running around the turn who were not necessarily running um, in the straightaways, right? And ba-boom, you know, you, you make your call. All right. This is very, very important, especially as a beginner judge. You need to be far enough back in order to see the walker properly, all right? We said in the rule, it is a progression of steps. So you wanna be able to see a good five steps. A good race walker has a uh, step of about one meter. So if you're five, if you wanna see five steps till they're directly in front of you, and the zone for judging is usually, you see them coming from 45 degrees away, you start judging until they're in front of you, and then you wait until they're um, 15 degrees to the right of you or to the side of you, and you stop judging. If you judge too early or too late, the angle gives the illusion that their knees are bent. So you have to wait till that you can, you can assess, hey, I'm going to look at this person. I'm going to start getting a feel for their walk when they're further away. But you wait until they're basically about five meters away if you're the right distance back. You've got that right angle uh, triangle there, and then you've got a, a step and a half afterward. And if you're five meters back, who's my math teacher here, right? How far, if, if you've got five meters going horizontally, how far is it going this way? <laughs> 
Nobody wants to be, you know, you're just like my students, right? Well, if this is a right angle, we remember that the two sides of a right angle. Oh, somebody? The hypotenuse is about seven meters then. But we, we're not looking for the hypotenuse. We're looking for, for this side. Which side? The one with the question mark. See a question mark. See the blue yeah, line? Oh, the blue line question mark, right? Yep, it's five meters, right? Because it's a right angle. So you got to be about five meters back, roughly 15 feet. At an indoor meet, that might be hard to do, especially if the walkers are two or three abreast. So do the best you can. As a race walking official, you are equipped with two paddles. One has a bent knee on both sides, and one has loss of contact at both sides. If you see somebody that is in danger of um, breaking the definition of race walking, you are supposed to show them a yellow paddle and write it down on, on something called a tally sheet. Um, you can give a caution for either yellow, uh, either loss of contact or bent knee. Um, but you can only do it once per athlete. And when we judge at, at an international level, it is strongly encouraged that you give somebody a yellow paddle and a chance to improve before they, um, hey, Don, you got to be monitoring the chat, man. Come on. Not it. <laughs> you, got, you got work here, buddy. Uh, <laughs> it was an answer of five meters, so you already yeah. covered it. Um, so we're encouraged to give the yellow paddle before going to a proposal for disqualification, which I'll explain next. Um, in a 1500 meter high school race, you may not be able to do that. If they're egregious and they're not even close to race walking, you can show them the yellow and then write the proposal for disqualification. Um, but, you know, again, art over science, there's no one steadfast rule. You got to use your judgment. Okay. When you give a yellow paddle, you want to be in that person's face, show it to them. I usually call the number out, like 25. You're, some say you shouldn't do that because if it's not English speaking, but you're at a beginner race, pretty much most people will speak English. So I give the paddle, I say 25. Um, there was an instance in San Diego where it was a pretty wide turn and I saw somebody run through the turn and the front of their shirt had their name and the back had their number. Well, I didn't have time to wait for them to go by me to see the number. So I called the person's name out. The name was on the bib. I knew who it was anyway. Not a big deal. You use your judgment. We're, we're there to help and make a fair race. We're not there to police and say, ah, oh, I got 17 red cards. What about you? You're probably doing something wrong if you have 17 red cards in a race, which brings <laughs> us to the red card. Okay. If you believe that the person should be disqualified and you want to give a proposal for disqualification, you have a red card, you fill out various pieces of the red card, the distance, men's or women's race, the bib number of who you're giving the infraction to, whether it was loss of contact, which is the little um, tilde, or the bent knee, which is a less than sign, the time of day, not in the race, time of day that the infraction occurred. You typically have a judge's number that may be pre-filled out for you. And then you sign the card and it either gets picked up by someone called a runner or you turn it in at the end if it's a short race. Okay, you can only write a red card once for each athlete, even if they have an infraction on the other part of the definition. You should still look like you're judging the person. Don't give away that you've given them a red card. Well, they'll just go run in, or they could just, you know, run by you. And I don't typically see that in races, but a, an athlete does not know um, that they've gotten a red card for you until it goes up on a DQ board, which we will get to in a second. There are some races that will have a penalty zone. Um, if you get three proposals for disqualification and there's a penalty zone based on the distance of the event, you go into a penalty zone for a certain amount of time and then you come back out. And if you get a fourth proposal, then you're disqualified. 
a short 1500 meter race is not likely to have a penalty zone. So when you're judging high school and beginners, you probably don't have to worry about this. Um, it has come to my attention. This was actually pretty cool. I produced a video on how to operate the penalty zone. I did it based on what I was told by USA ATF standards. And I was told that was completely made up. And the thing that we did was we didn't allow aid or bathroom usage in a penalty zone. That's sort of the standard in USATF. Um, that's not in any rule book anywhere. So we've got to address that and, and re-educate everybody. Okay, the chief judge can disqualify somebody or the chief judge's assistant if the chief judge is not available. They have a red paddle. If three red cards from three different officials come in and there's no penalty zone, they can be disqualified from the race. If you're using a penalty zone, then you need the fourth card. Okay, you have a judge's tally sheet where you will fill out the basic information about the race, the competitor number, the time that you gave the yellow paddle, whether it was loss of contact or bent knee. And then if you give a red card, which is the proposal for disqualification, you put the time down at the end of the event, you, you write your name and you sign it. Jeff, uh, speak, speak, speak for a second that the visual of a yellow paddle isn't absolutely necessary if the athlete says, well, no one ever showed me a paddle, but I got three DQ or three warnings or whatever. Um, you know, in the if they're in a big pack and there's just not time, and then the next lap they've corrected it, but you've written it down. Um, you know, so it isn't an, a, a steadfast rule for the athlete to barter at the end. Well, I, I wasn't shown that, so it doesn't count. Um, and, and that and we see that a lot with the uh, the rookie officials that they're a little tentative, but they're writing um, warnings down, but not showing the pack. So the way I handle that, Don, and, and you know, it depends who you ask if you should do this or not. Um, I will often say, if I can't get it to them in time, because I like to assess, right? I sit and I do my assessment. And the next time they come by, if they've corrected, I'll say, this is from the last lap and show them the yellow. Good point. Right? Just to try to communicate as much as possible. But it's not that I'm right and someone's wrong for not doing it. You know, this is the style of officiating depending on how literal you are with all the rules. See, Gary's not here, so I can I can now <laughs> add-lib the, the next generation of officiating. Um, well, and I, th and I think the reality is, is, you know, we're not required as officials to give a yellow paddle. It is sort of a courtesy, right? Um, but I think any of us who do it on a regular basis, um, use it as an opportunity like it here's an opportunity hey something looks wonky to me here's your opportunity like i'm saying hey here's a chance for you to fix it right so it's 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 a way to sort of say to the athlete i'm looking at you it's kind of looking weird and and, a, and an athlete can have an athlete can have a yellow paddle from every single judge twice and there's no proposal for disqualification so right. I, at a race where there's time, there'll be a DQ board that shows the athlete's number and the infractions that they have. At the end of the race, there's something called a tally sheet. And we're not going to spend the time for beginners on how to fill all this out. I've got videos on how to fill all the paperwork out. If if, if you're interested, it's on the yeah. website. Um, but somebody at the beginning, it will not be you, will fill this paperwork out um, on your behalf. So... So there was a question in the chat around the symbol for the bent knee. So I think, um, because if you look at the, if you, right. So if you look at the tally sheets, it looks one way, but if you look at the DQ board example, um, it's it's sort of the uh, going so, the so other internationally, direction. <laughs> it, yeah, internationally, it is a less than, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get into the, um, <laughs> race walk versus race walk debate. I feel like I, I, I resolve that with the AI chatbot video, but some people would like race walk to be one word and they change things, right? And I, I, I'm an old school OCD. 
race walk is two words. That's the official definition. When the IWF hands it to me as a less than and not a greater than sign, I follow, or world athletics, I follow world athletics. I, if, if you have a paddle and it's going in the other direction, it's not the biggest crime in the world. You'll be just fine. Yeah, I think at the at the end of the day, certainly at high school level or any, um, you know, sort of beginning level, uh, they're not. It's the little pointy sign. They don't care which direction it goes. And I think even even our elites, um, our Olympians, you know, they just. They know that they know that sign going either either direction. They know what it means. They know that there's a bent knee. If, if you can tell anything that I wrote, which is in the PowerPoint, it's less than, but I was using images that were handed to me and those were greater than, right? So I need to, need to update some images. All right, right? If the athletes are walking within the definition, you do nothing. It's been the theme of what we've been saying, okay? You give the benefit of the doubt, you call what you can see, okay? Um, there are different categories of race walking judges as a beginner. You know, at some point you have to take a test to know all this, right? We, the judges, make the decisions about whether they adhere to race walking or not. On a road course, there's six to nine of them. Um, nine would have to be like on a 2K loop. That's a lot. On a track, there's five. That includes the chief judge. Um, in international competitions, the rules are a little bit differently. And the chief judge can DQ someone in the last 100 meters. Um, it's also for national championships. As a beginner, you don't have to worry about that. There can be a chief judge's assistant that notifies the chief judge of DQs and relays information back and forth. There's a secretary or recorder that's filling out the summary sheet and the paperwork. There's the posting board operator that's working the DQ board. And then someone that operates the penalty zone. Okay, so in summary, right, in a typical race, most walkers are within the rules. You should not be proposing disqualification for half the field. Some walkers are in danger. They should be cautioned. A few walkers may not be within the rules. They should be disqualified. The yellow panel shows the walker a caution. The red card is your vote for disqualification or what I've been calling a proposal for disqualification. And um Don, I'm going to let you read the rest as I go handle the, the mashugana in the back. My dog is barking. All right. It takes the red cards from three separate judges for a walker to be disqualified. If no penalty zone is used, it takes red cards from four separate judges for a walker to be disqualified if indeed a penalty zone is used. If a penalty zone is used, uh, walkers may serve time penalties before disqualification or have a time penalty added to their final time. Uh, when you make calls, record the time of day on the tally sheet. This is your record of call. So as Jeff mentioned, the time of day, not the time of the race. Um, act independently. Don't be influenced by others around you. Don't be afraid to make calls. You are a member of a judging panel. Your calls alone do not disqualify a walker. Which yeah, is I a would great say point. it is. Go yep. Ahead. Um, and the other one is the time that you record your call. Um, even if you're doing a high school race, do that because there has been in in the recent past um, a race where the coach did um, protest their walker being disqualified. Um, and the, the issue was, do you have, do you have the tally sheets? Do you have it down? Um, we did, um, but it does happen not often, but it, it can. So it, it is important for good record keeping to have it done. As Jeff mentioned on the international and, uh, national championships, the, um, Chief Judge does have the power to disqualify in the last 100 meters. Uh, Section 6 has adopted what Gary Westerfield recommended, and that's uh, the last 50 meters, the Chief Judge. If an athlete is blatantly running because they did not receive any warnings, that they may also be disqualified uh, by the Chief Judge in the last 50 meters. 
Um, and I will say, as I am typically chief judge for section five, we also do that. Which I think you have to, especially in the beginning uh, stages there, yeah. you know, it, they, they get caught up because it's an exciting time and, and everyone's trying to make a, a sectional time uh, standard as well as qualify for the statement. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions at this time? I know uh, Jeff will be back in a sec uh, after four months and gets uh, his uh, attention. <laughs> and Sharon. Yes. Um, hey, hey. There you are. No, we had some people have to jump off to another yep. meeting and that's fine. And Pat had a question. Go ahead, Pat. Um, what do you look for? And it's a lot easier on outdoor uh, than indoor because of all the people. But what do you look for in the distance to try and zero in on somebody coming in on you that you want to look at uh, a little bit more closely? So honestly, I don't look much in the distance. Um, you know, I've been doing this long enough. I know what I'm looking for when they get close. I, I just look when they get close. Um, but if there was a pack of people coming, honestly, you're looking for the bouncing head. Yep. Right. Um, but I, I always felt like trying to prejudge doesn't really work. Um, I, there's so many times I look at somebody at the wrong angle and I'm like, oh my God, that knee looks so bad. And then they come in front of me and they look just fine. So if I can't make the call when they go in front of me, I'm not worried about making the call. Yeah, and I, and I will say, you know, for high school, 1500 meters, um, I tend not to look in the distance for that either. Um, and a lot of the races I've had lately, I can see straight across the track if I wanted to. Um, so I could see a lot of things all the way around, but I, I don't. Um, I look at my judging area and if they go by me once and it looks funky and weird then i'm paying attention the next time and they'll get the paddle the next time um you know seven and a half laps if they're funky on lap two they're probably gonna be funky on lap three four and five um or they fixed it one of the two um so i, I tend not to look in the distance and make make uh, plenty of notes, uh, you know, just just to remind yourself what you just saw, because, you know, with eight, we had 18 in the race last weekend. Um, and also uh, make sure that the clerks know uh, if anyone's outside of five and six, make sure the clerk know to give them two numbers, a hip number and a chest upper right chest number because that inside left. You're not able to see the number. And so you're trying to figure out if it's a green school. What is that? Is that? you know, Allegheny Langstone, is it, you know, whatever the teams are. So you're really working with the numbers and they must have their upper right uh, chest number so that you can see it. Yeah, I, I agree. We had 22 this weekend. Um, wow. So that was quite um, the packed start. Um, and actually I had them all shift. Um, they both, they all had two numbers. They had their hip number for the camera for our um, timing company. And then their second number, I had them put in the middle of their back. Um, it's easier, you know, I can warn somebody as they're going by and then I can catch their number um, afterwards um, Good point. because it's in the middle of the back. And so that's, that's something I sort of picked up from doing um, New Balance National Outdoors where we've had them in the middle of their back and some of the other um, larger races like that. So, and you know, I'm one of these weird academics that actually has worked for a living in, in corporate America as well. And, <laughs> you know, I'm a big believer of continuous quality improvement, right? My first boss taught me that. And, you know, mistakes are mistakes. You learn from them and you get better. So if you're watching a race, and I do this to this day, I scribble num numbers down to people, eh, I'm not sure of this person, right? And at the end of the race, if three other people gave somebody a red card for somebody you were unsure of, well, then you probably should have trusted your instinct. And if nobody else gave a call, then you might be a little sensitive and a little quick to judge, right? Or you may be the only one that sees it, right? Sometimes only one judge actually sees it. And it's either because they're different in front of you, you're on the bank and someone else isn't, 
or you're right and everybody else is wrong. I've been in a race where <laughs> one one judge made the right call. I'm like, ha, what do they know? And then I went home and watched the video. I'm like, oh, yeah, they got it. And I missed it. Right. And I wrote that person. They probably thought I was going to rip them and say, oh, I watched the video and look what you did wrong. And they were very happy to get that email. Oh, <laughs> You know, we're, we're not perfect. It's okay. That's why there's a group of us. And collectively, usually we make the right call. And, I, awesome. and I will say after a race is done or a meet is done and all those scores have been turned in, you know, I, I am, I have never been opposed and I, and Jeff has done it and Don has done it. I think you both have probably done it with me. Um, as I've gone back and said to officials who are more seasoned than I am, what did I miss? Like, what did you see in this person that I missed? Mm -hmm. Like, where did you see this? How, how did this, you know, it wasn't a blatant big bent knee. What did it look like? Um, so, it, you know, that's a way after all the scoring is done, <clears throat> I think we're all more than willing to say, hey, this is what I saw when you're like, what did I miss? What did you see that I didn't see in this person? Um, sometimes it's just where you are on the course, um, going around a curve, right? You might just see something there that on a straightaway, an athlete's not having an issue, but around that curve, they look a little runny. Um, so, so, that's just a different perspective based on, on where you're located, but sometimes it's in their form. Um, and I yep. think it's always good to, to get feedback, but again, after the notes are done, after you've turned in your own tally, um, that's the time you can have that discussion. One aspect I'd like to just touch on real quick, and then we'll wrap up, um, at the end of the race, when the winner finishes, but yet two more minutes are going to go by before the last finisher, it's still important to judge. I, I see a lot of my fellow judges uh, wrap it up and say, well, I guess the winner's here. You picked it. Uh, but if you're qualifying for sectionals or whatever, what happens is at the end of the race, the beginners, the rookie walkers are getting fatigued and the straightening of the knee isn't as easy as it was the first six laps. So that last lap and a half can be like a marathon for them. So it's important to stay on track and, uh, you know, keep judging right through the uh, last finisher. I, I actually and got really yelled at. for 50. Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. That's right. I got yelled at by an elite walker because she's like, you know, it's a 50K. You don't have to judge the last lap kind of a thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> um, yeah. Which br brings an important point. You know, don't engage with athletes. Um, right. If you are there to judge and only to judge, you can engage after the race, but, you know, um, don't. If, if someone yells at you, just ignore it, continue judging, doing what you have to do. Um, especially in today's world. <laughs> I'm pretty sure no one's concealing during a race walk. I think we're, we're safe on that, but. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, just, just the other piece to go with Don's just as a thought, yes, it's important to continue to do that. Um, here locally, um, I believe it was state cues last year. We had one of the lead uh, leaders disqualified after the race. Um, when everyone turned in their tallies. Um, and if people had stopped officiating prior to that, we wouldn't know about those who came behind, whether they really right. qualified or did not. Yeah. Um, so race walk isn't just about getting across the finish line. Um, it's about doing it as cleanly as possible. So, and, and, and usually um, the chief judge will have one or two judges migrate near the finish. So that if someone runs down the straight, there are three people there to see it. There you go. That's awesome. Great. Let's end on that note. Uh, want to appreciate everyone who is uh, 